Good afternoon. Uh, we're coming to you live from the Holler Studios uh, at KVEC in Hazard. My name is Denny Paul May, and in the, with me is my cohort, uh, Brenda Combs. And uh, we're com coming to you, talking to you a little bit about what's in the IEP guidance document in regards to transition for students uh, that are either uh, 13 and above, grade f uh, 8, 14, and the 16 um, year old requirements. And certainly I'm going to talk to you about that and then uh, down the road we'll, we're going to come back and do a complete training on transition um, sometime in January. So uh, without further ado, we'll, we'll go ahead and start on page um, 47 of the IEP guidance document. Um, we, we, we see there that, you know, uh, there are many things that have to be done and they all have to be done and you, if your re records are reviewed in your district, you have to get yeses on all the indicators. So indicator 13 is what we refer to as transition. Indicator 13 is a federal indicator. Each year, OSEP expects the state of Kentucky to report uh, how compliant we are in getting these uh, pieces done correctly. And so uh, the potential exists across the state of Kentucky for any district to be uh, reviewed through a desk review or through some type of audit, uh, whatever the State Department uh, sees as necessary at the time. And certainly uh, when they look at your records, uh, we want to be compliant. So we're going to go through some of those things uh, that, uh, that are necessary if you were to be called for an Indicator 13 desk review. And certainly, like I said, uh, it is so, so important. Uh, to know what the pieces are and to know how to uh, get those pieces in place. Um, KDE has provided us with a um, new uh, transition training and uh, like I said in January we'll be coming back to you with that with a voiceover and we'll provide slides and things of that nature so that you'll have all that information that you need. But today we're going to talk about what's in the uh, document itself and what, what is there and kind of get you started uh, uh, if you are in fact um, new to this game or if you are an I, uh, documenting the IEP for students uh, with uh, disabilities at the, at the middle school and high school level. So All right, so when you're looking at the IEP, um, as Jenny Paul and I said previously, we have uh, everything starts from that present levels. And we're looking at the transition needs section of your, prens of your present levels when we're, when we're talking about what needs to be in there. Um, so when we're looking at uh, eighth grade students or age 14, that could be 14 and the sixth grade. It doesn't matter. when there, It's e either or. You know, it's not or. It's either fourth, uh, 14 years old or eighth grade. Um, and again, as he was discussing earlier, um, sometimes we have to look at that when they are 13 because they may turn 14 during that IEP frame and you don't want to have another uh, a meeting just to hold for the transition. So we usually do that together. So when looking at the, uh, the present levels, you're, you, you're looking at that and of course we know one of those areas um, is the transition needs and what does that student need and the way we look at that is we look at the assessment that you've given. Now, is assessment a test? No, it's not a test. Uh, it could be a parent survey. It could be a student survey. It could be an interview. It could be the ILP. It could be multiple uh, things uh, that's listed on page 47 in the IEP uh, guidance document. What we are finding uh, right now is that some of our, since career cruising, uh, it's no longer free uh, and provided by KDE. Uh, districts are having to provide their own uh, assessment. Make sure that your district has an assessment uh, for that process because that is what tells us uh, what the student is good at, uh, what um, uh, employment opportunities are there that, that they can be uh, good at. So. We need that, so make sure that uh, you have that type of assessment. And if you're a teacher and you don't know if you're using that uh, or what you're using, please contact your director and they will let you know. A lot of our districts here are using what they call ACE, 
and uh, some of them are also using Zello, which Zello is X E L L O. Mm-hmm. So if you want to uh, Google it or whatever, you can uh, see what 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 it's like. But anyway, uh, make sure that you have one of those. Um, we're also looking at these uh, coordinated transition activities that uh, the students are look at, need. And we focus a lot on academic and functional performance uh, and the achievement. So a lot of times we're forgetting that functional piece. So we need to make sure that we're looking at that as, as, as well. And again, uh, these activities, they have to be results oriented. Everything is based on data anymore. So we have to make sure this is as well when we're looking at this uh, transition. Um, Those activities also facilitate the student's movement from uh, school to post-secondary activities. So it's from what they're doing at school, making sure we're providing them those services that are needed. Uh, So once they get out uh, and they're going to college or they're going right directly into uh, a work uh, area, that they're going to be successful. And that is left up to us to make sure that they're get being provided those, those pieces. Um, those activities, they also must be based on the results of the age-appropriate transition assessments. So we want to make sure that we're not giving a high school child something with smiley faces or, or, or un, you know, unhappy faces or whatever that. So you know, we need to make sure that what we're doing is age-appropriate. And Brenda, I might add too that sometimes we do some transition assessment up front as a seventh grader, and when they sure. move to all the way to the twelfth grade or they stay to age twenty-one, uh, there's quite a bit of change that occurs with a student. Definitely, and so we need to assess from year to year, and we need to, you know, present level means present level. So our assessments need to be they need to be uh, very new. And they need to be very current. And so they need to be, uh, yes, age appropriate, but they also need to be timely in that they need to sure. address what's what's happening with that child in the present. Because I don't know how many times as a teacher that I, as a special education teacher, I would have a student uh, at the ninth grade level change three or four times by the time they're a senior uh, oh, yes. as to what their goal is for beyond that high school and that's experience. Normal. And that's a normal thing. Yes. And so you need to provide you need to provide assessments for that and you need to be looking at those things. So I didn't mean to interrupt. And that's but true. But I'm glad he, he mentioned that because mm-hmm. that is so much true. Uh, one year they may want to be a, a welder and the next year they may change their mind. They, they may want to be a carpenter. Uh, so, you know, you have to look at those types of things and because the multi-year course of study has to match uh, whatever that student wants to be. Uh, so that means we have to change things. Uh, we have to and you know, Brenda, too, when we're reviewing these files, we're seeing uh, very little discussion in the conference summary about that multi-year course of study. When your student is in high school, you need to act as kind of like a college counselor and, and talk to them about how how much they progress they've made toward graduation. Uh, are they on the right track? Is the Are the courses that are on the multi-year course of study still consistent with what they are trying to do and it's just it's just some guidance that we provide for the student because they need that guidance in regards to where where we're headed you know um think about your own uh, college experience and think about the 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 time that you're trying to figure out what you want to do we kind of don't know sometimes when we're 18 so these kids probably don't know really if the courses they're taking match up with what their intended interests and preferences and what the what the surveys tell us that they would be good uh, in this particular field or that particular field. We need to capture that, and we need to make sure we capture all that documentation in the conference summary because there needs to be rich discussion in those conference summaries that tell us what's going on back and forth between the student and the art committee and how we're talking with that student uh, in a in a manner that is done with fidelity and that we're providing them the guidance that they need. And that's one thing that I have we have found doing the uh, record reviews. Uh, the documentation is not in there. Uh, so we must make sure not only are we com- completing that multi-year course of study from the current year throughout uh, graduation um, or exiting the program uh, for our low incidence students, um, we must have that uh, discussion in that uh, conference summary. So just make sure that we do that. So 
we've talked about the present levels and the, the piece that it starts right there, and then it continues on out uh, throughout our, our IEP. So the next thing that we're actually looking at is um, we're looking more at the goals, uh, writing the goals. Um, we know that at age 16, and again, it could be at 15 because a child could turn 16 in that IEP frame. Um, underneath the goal, you will see education training box and uh, employment box and, of course, your da daily living uh, skills box. There's three of those there. And you can only mark one area per goal unless you only have one goal. And that will be very limited. Uh, that would be like maybe a, a related service, a speech child or something of that nature that you're only going to have a, one goal. So it's only one box per goal. And you have to look at that goal and you have to determine which one uh, does it uh, associate more with. But we have to make sure we have to have the training education uh, goal and we have to make sure we have an employment goal. And then for those low incidence students, um, they also need to have an uh, independent living goal. So they will have three of those uh, boxes marked. Uh, so we just need to make sure that those are marked. Uh, that is one of the compliance indicators that we have to do. Um, sometimes I find that they've got both of those boxes marked and they've got maybe four or five goals. So we just need to make sure that we're only marking one per goal uh, and base it on what the child's um, career uh, uh, is going to be. Um, so when we're talking about, like I said earlier, about those transition assessments, on page 47 of that IEP document, it lists a lot of things there that it could include, but that is just a, a short list. There is more things that could be added to that um, as well. So we need to just make sure that that's there. And we had talked uh, in a previous um, video uh, that we did about our SDI and uh, supplementary aids and services. And that's one of the pieces that we look at as well because we're looking at your post-secondary goals and, and, and Denny Paul's gonna be talking about that or, uh, later on. Um, we've talked about our measurable goals um, and then we go into our special design instruction and our supplementary aids and services. Those are things that those kids are will need as they pursue an educational career. Um, if they plan on going to college, then they need to take their latest IEP and their latest uh, psychological, and they have to take it to the disabilities coordinator at that college. Does that mean they're gonna get all the accommodations that's on that list? We don't know, it just depends. Um, so that's one thing that our students are not aware of is that they do have to have that latest psychological and they do have to have the latest um, IEP. So we just need to make sure that that, that is there. Um, then after we look at our goals, we're, like uh, Denny Paul said, we're trying to close that gap as much as we can. And we know sometimes that that's a challenge for some of our students. Uh, but we now know that there are colleges that are out there that are now supportive of uh, special education students and know that the need uh, that they, they that, that's there. So um, we have to look at the different pieces to when we're looking at uh, the present levels, when you're, we're talking about our 16 year olds or it could be 15 year olds, because we have those boxes that talk about the instruction. And really, you know, the instruction starting right there in the eighth grade uh, or 14 years of eight and older, we talk about the instruction there. Um, we also talk about if they have any type of related services uh, that they may need after graduation. So we're looking at this transition box in the present levels as though what's gonna happen and what do they need after they graduate. Uh, that's been a concern there because some people think that is what uh, they feel like is gonna be happening while they're at the school level. This is after, um, after they graduate or after they exit. Um, we also look at employment. Uh, that's a big piece, I think, especially in their junior and senior year, that we should be marking that box as, as well as instruction um, because we do know some of our kids do work. Uh, they work in, in uh, restaurants. They work at Walmart. They work at different places. Uh, they have a part-time job, and that sort of helps. And then we had the community work-based program 
that's out in many of our districts um, that I recommend to all districts. I think that is a, a great program uh, to assist our students in learning all these uh, job-related um, pieces that our kids need to know. Um, you know, then we have acquisition of daily living skills. So those, those are things that some of our kids may need. And then, of course, the provision of functional vo uh, vocational evaluations um, for some of our students that, that also might need to be uh, discussed. So those boxes are very important. And uh, like Denny Paul said earlier, whatever we're talking about, it must be discussed in that conference summary. So now instead of that little bitty short page um, conference summary, it's going to be more than a, a, a short page. It's probably going to be three and four and maybe more pages in that conference summary because we have to document everything that we go over in that ARC meeting. So now I'm going to turn it over to Denny Paul, and he's going to talk to you about the post-secondary goals. Okay, by the student's 16th birthday or earlier, if appropriate, measurable post-secondary goals are developed. Um, and, and you'll find this on page 48 Eight. in your IEP guidance document. Um, and then there's a hot a link there too to transition resources for detailed examples and recommendations. But basically what you're, what you're trying to hit here is once you have put it all together, you've written your present level, you've got your ILP, you've got your multi-year course of study, you know what the interest and the preferences and what, what, what all that information tells you, then you can develop a goal that has both um, an education piece in it, a training piece, education training piece together, and then also a specific employment goal. So you always talk about what's going to happen in the future after graduation, after high school, and that's that's a that's that first uh, phrase up front, and then you would insert the student's name, and of course, then you would talk about what the goal is in in, in terms of what where are you going to get your education, where you're going to get your training, what type of training are you going to get, is it going to lead to some type of certificate, or is it is it just going to be on the job training or whatever? But then it's also going to lead you to a specific employment goal. And uh, lots of times we'll see uh, things like um, uh, a job in the retail setting, for example. Well, that maybe need to tweak, be tweaked just a little bit, and 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 say, well, is it going to be a cashier? Are they going to what what job are they going to are they going to hold? Are they going to be a teacher, or are they going to be a principal? Are they going to be a instructional assistant? What is it? What is it exactly? That keep in mind, it's a goal. And if, if it's not reached, um, then it's not reached. But it's certainly at this moment in time, based on assessment, based on our data, we've, we've uh, have uh, listened to the student. We've had discussions. We've guided them through the multi-year course of study. We've uh, made sure that they are matriculating to graduation. And we are now looking in that 16th year, or a little bit prior to that, that here is where we think they may fit. And so it would say something like, after graduation, John's goal is to enroll at Big Sandy uh, Technical and in order to receive training in the field of nursing uh, and in order to, then the specific employment goal comes in, in order to get a job as a nurse at a particular place. Uh, now, you don't have to put that particular place in there, but you have to have the the bare necessities are that you have to say after graduation, you have to put the student's name in, you have to identify where um, the student's going and what kind of a program they're going to enroll in and then what kind of job it's going to lead to. And uh, then, you know, sometimes we uh, think, we think, well, okay, do they need an independent living goal? Uh, you just have to ask yourself, how independent are they? And if, um, you know, they have some intellectual disability, uh, if they have some uh, difficulties uh, that way, uh, then certainly it's something that you need to discuss and to uh, document that you discussed it and that it's needed or not needed. And if it is needed, then it's something like this. After high school, uh, John's goal is to uh, do this independent living behavior, where they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. So the examples may sound like this. Uh, this is what's provided in the guidance document itself. After graduation, Malik's goal is to enroll in courses at the community and technical college in order to work in the field of medical technology as a lab technician. 
And then after graduation, Jody's goal is to enroll at a job training program in order to work as a cashier at the local hardware store. But you see, there's a job training program, there's, a, there's an education piece, uh, there's a training piece, and then there's that particular job. And you got the student's name and it's after graduation. So those are certainly um, some examples that are provided for you. We also have extensive examples that we have in the new uh, training that's provided by KDE. And we'll certainly be hitting that uh, in, a, in a video near uh, and dear to our hearts in, in, the, in the next little bit uh, in, the, in the coming month of January. And so, and then there are, uh, there's another one here after graduation, John's goal is to receive on-the-job training in order to work as a car assembly technician at the local manufacturing plant. You can see they're identifying what the job is, and I think that's the number one problem I see when we go to do the um, uh, record reviews around this particular post-secondary goal is that they're leaving that specific job out. And I, that's why I hit that kind of hard, as I want you to realize that it's not enough to say you're going to get a job in this field, we'll need to know exactly what job you're intending for yes. the student to or get. Or get a degree in this, but you're not saying what they're going to do. You'll say a medical field, but you forget to say that they're, go they're going to be a nurse. Those types of things. Right. And another thing that uh, caught my eye, and it's not as bad now as it was in the, uh, years ago, but some of the goals are not realistic. Uh, you've got in there, some of them are going to become doctors uh, when we know that their cognitive disability, is, it's not going to happen. So, you know, that's when we need to talk with our students and say, okay, what part of doctoring uh, do you, are you looking at? And it could be that the child may end up being a CNA because they want to help people. Um, so, you know, you look at those things and, and we have to be realistic uh, we can't put stuff like that in there because, again, that's a legal document, and we're trying our best to do what that student can do. And did that transition assessment, um, did, did you get that that student had that capability of doing stuff like that? So that's one, good, one reason why I said, you know, if your district does not have, um, you know, we don't have career cruising anymore um, unless you've paid for it, um, that you need some other type of assessment. And again, ACE and Zello are the two that we have here that are using in our KVAC area. So make sure that it's realistic um, and, and not just a fantasy of what the student would like to do. You know, those conversations are difficult to have sometimes, yeah. but the more we put into the relationship with the student, by right. providing them with the experiences, the rich specially designed instruction that we talked about in the earlier video, the more that we engage with them, the more we get them engaged in class, the more we carve out that uh, relationship, the easier it is to guide them. And if we start that very early on, we can really mold that. It doesn't have to. It doesn't have to drop a ton of bricks on them when they're 14. We can we can work on that as we move through, and we can we can intelligently lead them uh, to uh, a place where they may not even realize they they want to go. And it's really hard for teenagers um, this day and time, as it was when we were teenagers. Okay. Uh, so to to determine what it is you want to do in life and what you want to be, and what you know, finding your passion and finding what you can do as a as a a viable vocation. So there's some other things too that we need to talk about in terms of goals. Uh, these are the independent living goals and uh, sometimes these more, uh, we'll see those more for our low incidence children or students and uh, upon completion of high school, Michaela's goal is to be able to independently prepare for work each day, including dressing, making her bed, making her lunch and assessing transportation. That's certainly, you see the, uh, what she's, you know, where she's going to do it, how she's going to do it. After high school, Marty's goal is to receive specialized training in academic, functional, and occupational preparation from Boke Rehab to be able to work in a supported employment. And, you know, Brenda, I've told you this many times, I see uh, many former uh, students uh, working in the supported employment positions uh, that have, uh, you know, these low incidence uh, disabilities, and um, they're doing quite well. And so it, it, it's, it's, it's a... It can be done. It's something that can be done with careful planning. Uh, and this whole transition thing is, it is careful planning. It's something that's uh, so supposed to unfold over time. And it's something we got to stay the course with. And we have to really put some thought into it. It really becomes the focal point of the IEP as we move into the 13, 14, 15, 16 year old 
students, and we, we really began to say, okay, we've got an hourglass here, and the, hour, the time's running out with this student. We're going to focus on continuing to provide access to the curriculum. We're going to continue to focus on helping them learn to read and do math and those types of things, but our focus now in the IEP becomes what are they going to do once they leave us? Are we providing them with the tools that they can be independent, that they can do what we um, need for them to be able to do in order to make it and, and, and to be taken uh, as, a, as a serious member of society uh, and, and you know providing them with just a little extra help, a little extra guidance that's going to push them over the top and it's going to make a difference in their life from from that point on. So that's that's certainly the goal of this. And you know, we also have um, a, a listing uh, on page forty nine of the types of services that we ha- are to document in the IEP. And we, you know, we certainly talk about instruction in the present level. We talk about how we're going to help them learn these certain things. What are the barriers to their post secondary um, uh, when we set that goal, what's the barriers to reaching that goal? Uh, but then we look at what we're what we are to really provide them as far as services are concerned. And there's some examples on page 49, at the top of page 49, and one that has to be always has to be there is multi-year course of study. We're always doing that back and forth counseling kind of thing with them as we outline it in the ILP. And all students are supposed to have an ILP. And so that multi-year course of study would be number one in transition services and and where we spell out what agency is responsible, and that would always be the high school or the district that the student is attending school in. And then opportunities to attend transition fairs and career fairs, and we have those. uh, We have a lot of offerings. We have a lot of offerings from KVEC, from our good friend Will Cayetan and and Heather Hall and and some of the and Tony uh, Hardens uh, doing the. Um, those transition fairs each fall and each spring. We have a lot of opportunities for, for engagement there. And certainly we would, uh, if you're not involved in that, we would, in, um, we would encourage you to take uh, full advantage of that for your students. And then information about supported employment agencies and services and opportunities to practice completing job applications and interviewing skills. Um, you know, making that linkage between those uh, that those outside agencies like Voc Rehab, like the community colleges, uh, some of those um, you know supported employment places, some of those uh, linkages that are there for students with disabilities. That once they become adults, they're adults with disabilities still, and they have the knowledge and the know-how to to make those linkages to the, to the things that they need. If it's adult living skills, whatever it might be, that we're thinking about this in a, in a broad sense and that we're capturing it and it becomes the focal point of the IEP at the high school level. Opportunities for work-based learning experience at school. And, you know, certainly uh, Brenda's already captured the fact that we have to tie our annual goals, you know, the, the goals that we're working on with instruction, we have to tie those back to the post-secondary goal, and those annual goals support that post-secondary goal as we move forward. Um, this, uh, at this time, this ends our uh, uh, blurb on transition as, as it exists in the uh, IEP guidance document. Uh, moving forward, we will, as promised, we will provide you with a voiceover uh, complete training, three-hour uh, complete training uh, using the new uh, KDE-approved uh, transition training, uh, and that will be finished sometime in January. So you can look for that. Um, and you can also tune in to our new teacher cadre, just because it says new, and it's also emerging teacher yes. cadre. Just because it's new and emerging doesn't mean that the um, old folk like us uh, can't tune in and and learn things. We have topics. Uh, we're getting ready to do. Uh, explicit instruction. We've had special design instruction. We've looked at measurable goals. We've looked at present levels. Progress We've looked at monitor. a myri- progress monitor. We've looked at a myriad of different topics each Wednesday. The fr- I think it's the second Wednesday second of Wednesday each month, each month. Uh, from 3.30 to 4.30, and we send those links to your directors. If you're not um, a privy to that information, please let us know. Send us an email, a text. We can get you hooked up, and you can certainly have those learning, those professional learning experiences across the board in your district, and you'll have um, access to a lot of good information that can help you uh, as you strive to be the best you can be for those students with disabilities in your district and on your caseload.